Uh, my name is Carrie Dorsky. I'm the operations coordinator here at the NWTC Artisan and Business Center. Um, what that means is I kind of handle all the day to day stuff, all the fun stuff, and I also handle all of our business and entrepreneurship programming, which is like the heart and joy of the work I do. So this artist journey series we do once a month and we do nine a year. So the way I try to set that up because I wanted to really help people is that we feature three artists a year. We feature three community organizations a year and I cover three business topics a year. So that's how I break it up because I think it's great to hear artist stories and hear from artists in our area who are doing amazing things. I think it's really important to hear from the organizations in our area, how artists can get involved, how organizations serve artists. And then I think it's really cool to cover a couple of business topics, some like tips and tricks and things like that along the way from other experts. So we usually do this on the third Tuesday of every month. Unfortunately, I had to cancel three weeks ago and I am still dealing with this terrible sinus infection. So if you see me like mute and pause and grab my water, it's because I'm coughing and I'm trying not to bother everybody with that nasty cough. So uh, before I get too far off on a tangent, um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for watching this content. Um, it's something I really enjoy doing and I'm so happy that we could reschedule this one because I think it's really important. And on that note, Kelly, I would love if you would introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you and who you are. Sure. Um, my name is Kelly Strickland. Um, my day job that I'm not really here to talk about is that I'm the executive and artistic director of the Widener uh, at University of Wisconsin Green Bay. But um, the order of the day is around Bay Area Arts and Culture Alliance and specifically Spark GGB, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And and you know what, we, you know, if there's time, we can talk Widener too, because I, I love to hear what you're up to. <laughs> and I think it's really important to hear what other arts organizations are doing. And I, as much as I am kind of rooted in the visual arts, the performing arts are just as important, and especially for artists and kind of crossover events, right? We could end up there talking about that today. <laughs> yes, we've done lots of crossover multidisciplinary <laughs> events in recent in recent yeah. times. Well, let's, um, let's start with BACA. Yeah. How does that sound? So sure. Tell us, I keep saying BACA. You said Bay Area Arts and Culture Alliance. So I just said all the words so people knew what BACA That's stood good. for. Yeah, because I'm always saying BACA and I'm like, oh, wait, I should pause and make sure everybody knows that acronym. NWTC is a college of acronyms. We are one of those organizations. And so we all kind of run around here speaking and acronym speak. And I need to remember to do that more often. So. Bay Area Arts and Culture Alliance. Can you tell us about that group and kind of how they formed and why they exist and all of that? Sure. Stuff? So I can talk about the inception of it. The inception really was not BACA. Um, it was um, something called the, the squad. Somewhat silly and informal, but it, it all it was kind of a loose evolution. Um, and the squad was essentially a just a quarterly convening of um, arts and culture stakeholders. We kept it intentionally very, very loose. And all of the invitations that came out to attend any of the squad convenings were intended to be passed along. That language was always in there. Um, and we really didn't um, define what criteria made someone eligible to participate, we kept it as broad as possible. So that included professional artists, it included community artists, hobbyists, arts educators, arts philanthropists. Um, in short, we just were interested in kind of trying to collect people who were interested in, uh, in the arts in our community. And um, we had those quarterly convenings for a couple of years. Uh, and we were sort of trying to find a home for it, like find, you know, so I think it lived for a little bit with Mosaic and then that that um, wasn't, they were kind of undergoing some organizational change and, uh, and then we talked about maybe moving it over to the art garage and they were going through some organizational change. And the folks that were kind of the driving energy behind the squad, you know, it was all volunteer based and 
and mostly we were just interested in kind of like keeping the energy going of having something regular where anyone could walk through the door and find other people who were committed to the livelihood and sustainability of the of arts and culture in our community. Um, COVID hit. <laughs> Every every arts and culture organization then has that moment, right? And then COVID hit, and um, the world shut down for us, right? Yeah. yeah. And at that point, honestly, I think a lot of the the folks, you know, we asked um, members of the squad the kinds of things that they were interested in learning about more or seeing happen in our community, and it, it was a lot of really big things, you know, really big. Um, undertakings. The kinds of undertakings that you associate with a community that has a really vibrant arts and culture <laughs> sector. Um, and it was becoming clear that, you know, the kind of happenstance volunteer energy around the squad wasn't really going to be sufficient to support those kinds of initiatives. Um, and a lot of it was, you know, were around um, things that you would expect coming from creative, so funding was a big, big topic. Um, and so the folks that had been that happenstance volunteer energy around uh, convening the squad said, okay, well, what would a representative body look like that was kind of meant to reflect what we were hearing from folks who were showing up at the squad convenings? And and the attendance at those at the squad convenings was, you know, it was loose, like it was different people every time, but we would have anywhere from 40 to 60 people, depending, you know, and it was becoming clear that if we were going to try to move the needle on any of the big desires of the creative community, something with more formal infrastructure was going to be required. And frankly, major investment was going to be required. Um, once we were into COVID, I think, you know, we took we took some surveys of the squad and said, well, what would a representative body look like to you? We collected information from from folks. We got several hundred respondents, um, took all that information and 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 tried to build that representative body. That representative body became BACA. Uh, in full transparency, I stepped away from the idea of BACA at that point because I was more interested in just kind of hosting those convenings and like keeping a sort of more informal relationship um, with all of it, but it was sort of, you know, super supportive of the idea of it. And I think that um, BACA itself was running into some walls trying to figure out like, you know, what is it we should be doing? There was the idea that there were other entities in the community doing the same thing. Is this duplicative, right? And and that's one thing I think that everyone's been very clear about. Like, we don't want to duplicate what anyone else is doing. Well, let's say that that conversation was all happening, you know, 2021, right? The last half of two, probably not a lot of conversations were happening at all in 2020. Let's not kid ourselves. Early 2021, like, an effort to kind of, you know, kick things off again. And then what happened was, <laughs> and the reason that that I personally jumped back into BACA and said, OK, we got to get to work and fast because um, there was $250,000 available to our community that was available to be regranted directly to artists and creatives in our community. And we did not have a service organization that was in a position to apply for it. And that for me was kind of it. I was like, all right, <laughs> no yeah, more yeah. of this kind of, <laughs> right? Everyone kind of going like, not it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, because sure. the, the kinds of work that, that we're talking about here um, are, are things like that, right? Going after the quarter of a million dollars that was available to artists. Um, in our community that simply no one applied for and it and there's a variety of reasons for it but um, when when the uh, members of BACA at that point talked about it like well what would have needed to have been in, in place um, 
you know, to some extent, I think the answer came back like, well, we're not, we're still not 100% sure. We really need a long term vision for the entire sector uh, in order to answer that question. And again, because this was an entirely volunteer led effort, that's not something any of us were in a position to do. So <clears throat> we partnered with um, a, a few entities in the community, uh, notably uh, Greater Green Bay Community Foundation, the Chamber of Commerce, um, Discover Green Bay, um, the City of Green Bay, um, I don't want to leave anyone out. Yeah, UW Green Bay, NWTC, um, the Canary Fund kicked in a little bit. So we sort of put together a little pool of money to say, let's go out and bring some consultants into our community because we're all too close to it and everyone has opinions and let's have consultants come in and ask our community what it is we need. It's and like that a was your perspective, right? Very big right. picture. You know, you when you're kind of boots on the ground, right? You see those big issues of like, how do we get this money? How do we do this? But I think it's really smart to to pull in outside, right? And to kind of step back and get that big picture perspective. What's the big story here? And how can we solve these little problems we're seeing every day with something kind of more sustainable and long term? Yeah. And everyone suffers from this. I certainly do, but it's, you know, when you when you work in the creative field, it's so hard. It's, it's a really hard sector to work in and it can be very easy to become myopic and just not simply not see the other things that are going on. Um, but to really spend the time to see and interview and ask the questions and visit the places and talk to the people and that takes a lot of time um, and we felt like we were going to be doing the greatest service to our community by bringing people in who've done this in other communities um, and kind of help us with the conversation so an rfp was put out a steering committee was formed there were 13 people on that steering committee um, it, there were representatives from everyone who contributed um, financially to the project. So all those entities that I just mentioned, in addition to our economic development entities who frankly in our community are responsible for a lot of the arts activities. So that's Old Main and on um, Broadway. Um, uh, who else? We had folks from um, uh, Title Town on the steering committee. We had freelance artists. Um, we had folks from Oneida, we had, we, we tried to cast a pretty wide net. Um, so that uh, steering committee was formed at, uh, an RFP was put out and we cast a really, again, like just trying to keep this as broad as possible. We identified all of the entities in our community that maybe mention the arts in their strategic plans or their priorities or their right you know there's some existing stuff out there that sort of says the arts is important to us um you know and then we listed other ways that we know the arts can be a powerful lever in our community like neighborhood strengthening community development initiatives um edi work of course economic development um, but all of these different ways that we know that the arts are a powerful tool. And we said, consultants, <laughs> can you come into our community and tell us how we can go about pulling some of these big levers to solve the, the um, both the challenges and, and sort of fill some of the voids in our community, um, all the while knowing that in order to do those things, we were going to have to invest in the actual creative sector. That was kind of a given, you know. So um, we brought in these uh, uh, to a, a team of consultants, Christine Harris Connections and Rinders Research. Um, Christine has conducted these kind of cultural assessments in um, other Come comparable size Midwestern cities as well as much larger cities like Austin, um, Des Moines, uh, you know, Eugene, Oregon, so all over the place. Um, and that's who was awarded the the contract. And then and then the work began. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that took us all the way to probably like February of 2022. It's amazing to be where we're at right now is where I'm kind of thinking, I'm like, oh my gosh, that was only beginning of this year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, it's, it is amazing. It's some, you know, it's very, when you're doing this kind of stuff, boy, does it get easy to sort of get lost in the forest? Like, have we made any progress? I don't know. Um, I, I'm just so excited. I know we're going to get to the results and talk about that in a minute, but it's, it's really interesting for me. I came into this role at the end of January of 2020. So like literally right before the world shut down. And yeah. so I was coming back to the arts after I had been away for a few years up in Sturgeon Bay and figuring out what had changed since I had left three years ago and like what organizations were doing what and who was responsible for what and who were the key players doing everything. And so I can like hearing your kind of timeline and as things kind of came together and the art squad meetings and I would have loved that when I was in this role, when I was at the center previously in 2017, that would have been so cool to be like informally breaking down silos and like chatting with people and hearing what everybody's up to and working on. I'm like, how amazing that that turned into this, you know, like that. Yeah, that you know, cool the only that. thing that I wish Baca, and the fact is like, we just didn't have the bandwidth, right? It, this goes back to the the volunteerism. And, and this is true of so many of our, of our creative organizations that were kind of overly reliant on volunteerism. And once we decided that we were really gonna drive this community-wide study, once we decided that we knew that we were gonna kind of pump the brakes on everything else because what was becoming really important is that we didn't want any individual or or the that group to make any decisions without understanding what the real needs were. And so that was, we just sort of went like tap, 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 and then let, let's see what comes of this. But I do think one thing I wish we, any one of us had kind of had that energy to, to keep driving were those informal convenings because frankly they were pretty fun yeah, <laughs> I bet. and and it was always like you know you would just assume like oh these two people have to know each other and and they didn't you know and some cool collaborations came out of it and so anyway i i i know that one of the things that i'm excited to return is just the idea of that um that kind of informal networking opportunity um for the creatives in our community I will but say, I even that yeah. you guys pumped the brakes you know if you yeah. the way you look at it especially now like hindsight right it's so smart to say let's get some data right let's get some research let's actually get the information so we can make the best decisions for this yeah. area and you know, everybody who's at the table has their own piece of the pie, right? Or has their own day job or their own perspective. And so to really get the research and the data from the entire community is important. And I think that that's smart. So obviously some things had to kind of fall to the wayside, right? You can't do it all. And we all have day jobs and we all have other things going on. I, I think I just said to you before we went live here that like, you know, at 4.30, I'm going to go home today. I've had a full day in my day job in this creative sector. So I get right. that. We, we, all, yeah. we all do a lot. And when you work in the arts, it's part of who you are. I think there's like a passion there. And sometimes you take on too much, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all of us suffer from a little bit of like yesism. Like, yes, yes, sure, no problem. Like, I'm excited um, about that idea. I want to help. And then you're like, oh, no, I have taken on too much. Yeah. I think our yeah, area. And then you has find that. yourself like not doing things as well as you you know yeah. wish but but I'll tell you one thing that I mean everyone conceded is that you've you've hit the nail on the head like what we needed was data collection we needed serious data collection and none of us were experts at that you know nor was any person raising their hand being like you know I'm I'm a I'm a data analyst. <laughs> I, I think run yeah. So having that so, outside perspective too that makes mm -hmm. it unbiased or at least as unbiased as it can get, right? Yeah. You know, because if it was somebody like 
perspective. Like if I was doing it right, I would have my own personal biases of like what I think the community should have. And right. so it's so smart to have some people from the outside come in and do that research and then present you with the findings to then take the next steps. You know, and yeah. I think from from my perspective and from what I hear, it's like, okay, why well, can't Green Bay get anywhere? This feels like a foundational step. You and know, that's and exactly a piece that wasn't missed that was missing. It's it it's foundational, right? And and in fact, it's so foundational that we are our consultants even said to us, if you want our professional opinion, you're not ready for a strategic plan. You actually don't have the underpinnings in place to develop a plan. And so what we got, what we ended up agreeing upon and contracting for was a full assessment um, and, uh, and recommendations coming out of those assessments from these consultants. So we, I mean, we still are, uh, you know, one of the steps that are included in, in, in these recommendations is a strategic plan, and it's not even the first thing. <laughs> so, I believe that. Yeah, I so we do. still have some work to do. Yeah. Um, but if I could, just to talk a little bit about what the, um, what the research strategy was, because it's important to understand how comprehensive this was. Um, so the consultants, and I'm going to read here because I'm not a yeah. researcher and data analyst. So uh, the researchers use what's known as a funnel approach where concepts are built upon and tested as the sample grows larger and fans out from the core. In this case, the research began qualitatively uh, with leaders and close relationships across the community to understand perspective and priorities. Those perspectives were explored in town halls and roundtable sessions. And after analyzing all of those founding, findings, those trends, insights, and concepts, all of that was then used to develop the quantitative community surveys. So in total, uh, in total we had 1,820 respondents, and that includes our 15 steering committee members, 40 one-on-one -on -one community interviews, 300 participants in eight focus groups or town halls and 1,460 community survey responses. So this was really far reaching. Our goal actually when we started and it felt like a reach, I think, you know, the life study, which is probably the the largest community wide study that that exists in our community, um, you know, for a community of our size, 2000 respondents is is considered like a good data set um, and the fact that we got to 1820 around a very specific topic of arts and culture um, is to me pretty mind boggling I'm I'm really proud of the fact that we did that <clears throat> and that included you know translating surveys that included um, you know going to uh, letting the chamber uh, or asking the chamber to have us bring the consultants to the meeting of all the municipalities in the county. I mean, it's it was um, every nook and cranny uh, and almost everyone that we asked to participate participated, which uh, was really gratifying. One of the things that will come with the final report is a list of all those participants, obviously not a list of every survey respondent, um, but all of, you know, everyone who registered for town halls or um, I don't think we listed youths who participated in the youth roundtables, but uh, it's it was a good cross sector sampling. That's really cool. Um, that. Green Bay kind of supported this in that way in Northeast Wisconsin, I should say. I think that um, shows that there is a lot of arts and culture here, a lot that people might not realize. So. Well, that's, I mean, I think one of the things that um, is um, most, uh, I don't want to say surprising, it doesn't actually feel surprising to me, but the level of um, belief that the arts and, and culture are good for our community 
in a variety of ways, right? Not in one sort of single perspective of what an what a creative experience should be. There's definitely, you know, it's broken down by sort of preferences for cultural experiences. Those that kind of information is collected, but um, but just a, a real consensus in the belief that it's good for us, you know, and um, and a belief that it's it's worth the investment of our community. So to be able to see that, and like I said, it didn't surprise me, but it certainly was gratifying to see it. Um, and then I would say, you know, the the other thing that feels um, uh, surprising to me is the sectors that, you know, the data is lumped by the creative sector because everyone's self-identifying when they're responding to these questions. The creative sector, the business sector, um, the public political leaders, and then the community at large, everyone's identifying in one of those. If you look at the graphs, there's like real, there's real harmony in like where people's peaks and values of priorities are. And um, it's, you know, unusual for, uh, for the public and political leaders to be way up here and the community at large to be way down here. Rather, there seems to be, um, uh, like I said, a harmony or a, a, a symbiosis of kind of like what's important to people and, and why. Um, and the final piece of this like data, uh, you know, why the data, why spend all the money on getting this data, what, you know, um, is that it, it, you have to look for the tools that are going to get us exponential investment, right? And when you're talking about like, we need uh, a sustainable entity that is not just going to complete the paperwork to get the quarter of a million dollars that was available for redistribution to artists, um, but is proactively developing resources that exist in perpetuity for creatives in our community to, to fire on all of the ideas that they have and all of the programs they have. Data is where you have to begin because you have to make the case and you've got to make the case to people who care about the arts and culture for very different reasons than creatives do. Um, so when I talk about the fact that there's great harmony, there is, but they don't all have the same reasons. <laughs> so when you're talking to your business sector, they're thinking about talent attraction and retention. That's what they care about. They don't, as individuals, necessarily care, you know, that there are those options for them as people. That's not what's motivating them to respond the way they're responding. And data is the way that you can speak to these groups universally. And that's why it was so critical for us to undertake this really laborious process, you know? Yeah, you can say all day long that it's good for everybody, but if you don't have the data to back it up, nobody's going to listen, right? Yeah, nobody's going to listen and and nobody's going to invest in the way and I'm and I'm not just talking about dollars investment, but of course dollars investment is important too. Um, I'm talking about time. I'm talking about like endorsement, support and enthusiasm for the from the most influential people in our community to bring everybody along. Um, and uh, and again, like data is just it is that. It's that objective language, the language of say, numbers. Like, universal, um, you know? Yeah. You're trying to talk to all those different sectors and all those different people. How else do you do it? Yeah. You know, you can try a persuasive story or a heartwarming story, but to a, a business leader, that might not sell it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So where we're at now is the draft final report originally we had hoped to have wrapped the entire thing up by early november that was our goal um <clears throat> there were a couple of circumstances that delayed that um one one of our consultants um experienced a loss and that um uh, took some time away from the project very understandably uh and then because the end of the project um sort of was pushed out a little bit, it fell into a much, much busier time for the project lead and the project manager. And that was um, 
uh, Lauren Axel at the chamber. She uh, was a really important piece of the management team of this and, and myself that was just doing a lot of the nuts and bolts of like keeping it going forward, you know. Um, so that delayed us a little bit as well because both of us were just at different points in our schedules than we thought we were going to be when we were wrapping it up. So the final report is now uh, the draft went to the co-chairs of the steering committee, which is Dennis Bueller at the Community Foundation and Alex Zacharias um, uh, from the Boys and Girls Club and so many other things. I feel like Alex Zacharias is just omnipresent. Everywhere. Yep. <laughs> um, so the the draft of the final report went to those folks. It went to um, the members of uh, that are currently involved with BACA. That's um, uh, Jan Scoville from NWTC. That is uh, Kent Hutchison. That's Chuck Ryback from UW Green Bay. Um, Alan Kapischke, who teaches the arts management courses here at UW Green Bay, and I should give that group a shout out because they've actually been really helpful. Um, those students uh, have really added value to this process. Uh, and uh, Cheryl Benton from Oneida uh, and myself, and I really hope I'm not missing anyone. Um, so uh, then all the feedback from that went back to the consultants and they've now one of the things that we asked for that was not in the draft that we received were recommendations in kind of phases because it felt a little overwhelming and we were like ah where do we start do um, all this stuff and it's a big yeah. long list like okay that's a lot to well, digest all at once and our worry was that we would take all the recommendations back to because it's really going to be the creative sector that we have to go back to first with all of these. And what I think we were afraid of was setting up a situation where as a group we were trying to decide what was most important. And that's hard because different things are important to different people, understandably. Um, but what we wanted from the consultants was lay out for us from your perspective, what has to happen before the next thing can happen? And um, I'm not going to, you know, be, uh, I don't think, surprising anyone who's been involved in these conversations all along when I say that the number one recommendation is around, well, the very first thing is about sharing publicly the, the findings. And so there will be a tour, so to speak, of, you know, going to different places and getting in front of different audiences to share what was found. But the, the second piece of it is some kind of leadership structure to unify our sector. And, um, you know, this kind of goes back to the very beginning of the story, right? Which is um, a, a sense that, you know, ah, we're kind of set, right? We have different entities doing different things. And then I just keep pointing at that quarter of a million dollars going, but somehow we're, we've got holes in the net, you know? Yeah, so uh, so that really is going to be the um, uh, the next big thing. There will be recommendations that go to this leadership task force, blah, 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 with some money attached to it, right? That says like, all right, if we had a staff that looked like this and they got paid this much of money and they we're doing these things as outlined in the recommendations, right? In order to get us closer to having that really robust, sustainable uh, creative sector. This is what it would look like in year one, year two, year three. Um, and this is these are the things we would be checking off the list. So we're in a it's it's exciting. Like it's it's time to jump now. Um, and it's been a long road. <laughs> it almost feels like, you know, you were at the base of the mountain and now you're at the top of the mountain, right? Like you did the big climb and now it's like, here we go. I think we are. I think we're, we're like, like halfway. Yeah, we're like halfway because I think that, um, you know, one of the things that has to happen and, and, and Carrie, you and I have had this conversation in a group and I, you know, I'm not, um, uh, I, I don't have any qualms about saying it out loud, 
when we had to kind of tap, 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 pump the brakes on what it is we were you know, doing, I think that letting, one of the reasons that letting the squad convenings go was not a great thing for this process um, because it didn't allow for as much kind of informal conversation about the process along the way. And so however this leadership structure is formed, to really pick up the ball and begin running, like that's when we're at the top of the mountain. Yeah, and sense. and I think that it doesn't exist right now, right? Like, as I said, BACA is not that entity. We're an all volunteer group. Um, so what it's going to look like and what it's going to be called and who it's actually serving and what that board, you know, a proper 501c3, all of those things are yet to be done. And getting the as much of the creative sector behind that as we can is going to be really, really critical. And I think that this is now where, like, if the ball has been run to the 50-yard line, I don't know anything about football, so I'm going to screw this metaphor up, like, <laughs> royally. Sounds good to me, so. What if you... It's like, no, it's not like football. We need like a a scrum. Like we need like, you know, 50 people with their hands on the ball taking it through this next step. Um, and I think that that's going to be fun. Like one, it's it's just going to, it's going to take it out of this like survey completion, you know, did you finish the training on this database kind of stuff into like, all right, let's, let's pull all of the people in. Um, you know, I have a, having a thought, and I know we're going to get close to this 4:30 mark, but I'm going to I'm going to go on this thought a little bit. If I picture all the organizations in Green Bay, right, and one of them just popped up and was like, "I'm going to be your arts advocacy, whatever organization," we would be like, "What ground do you have to stand on?" Right? But now I'm, I'm, you know, as we're on this kind of journey and pulling in this data and the outside perspective and getting everybody from our community to be involved and have their voice heard and be a part of it, what better way to start a nonprofit, right? What a better way to start something for this community than to have the buy-in and the participation from the data, from the beginning, from the like inception of this idea. And I think I can see the like birth of this nonprofit coming and it's exciting because mm -hmm. I think back to when I got started in this role and I had such a hard time figuring out who was doing what now and what organization had changed their mission to do something else. And I'm like, you're who I used to call for this. What are you doing now? Or your organization used to serve this audience and they're not anymore. Who's serving that audience? So I am like so excited to be a part of the arts in Green Bay in Northeast Wisconsin and see this coming forward because I think it's only going to benefit everybody. So. That's the hope. Yeah, that is I the can, hope. I can see it. And I think that there's been like, you know, especially when it's all volunteers and they're doing it in and amongst their other responsibilities and jobs, it's hard to communicate everything to everybody. And I think that's the part where like, I'm like, what's going on over there? Who's doing what over there? Somebody's saying something about it over here. And I'm like, you know, I think that and I'll lose my train of thought here and darn antibiotics. But I think it's really cool to see this kind of coming together and this kind of hope for Green Bay. Um, I've worked at a couple of organizations in the area. I've always been in the arts and it's always felt a little disconnected. It's always felt like the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing or we double book things on different dates or, you know, like we don't know who to go to or, you know, some of us attend the Americans for the Arts stuff and some of us don't. And it's all this kind of like who's doing what and it's cool to, it's cool to be at this part and it's cool to hear well, Max, all the work that's going on it's really important to you know a few findings that everyone will be able to read in the 81 page report um that are really unique to our community is you and this probably is not going to feel surprising half of it won't feel surprising and half of it will for a, for a community of our size, we actually have very few arts and culture nonprofits. And the ones that we do have, have very, very small budgets. What we do have 
way more of are freelance artists. And what we have even more of, and I'll tell you that people outside the arts and culture who see this, are, their eyes get huge. What we have even more of than anyone I think would have surmised are the number of creatives who are living in the footprint that this survey was serving and make the lion's share of their revenue outside of our community. And I mean, I was, I'm married to one, right? My husband is an actor and he, in order to be booked as an equity actor, he has to leave our community. Um, so I think that, uh, but I think for people who are not working in the arts to hear that, that hits them different. They're like, what do you mean they're going somewhere else? And it's like, because we have talented people who live here and we don't have the opportunities for them to earn their living. And so if they're here and we provide the opportunity, <laughs> right? Like Absolutely. what kind of magic can we make happen? Um, and I think that there's been a terrific underestimation of the number of those individuals. And um, and I think that, that is, that's going to be a pretty impactful piece of it. So we're going to be in an even, frankly, more challenging situation than a typical community would be because if organizations are hard to unify, and they are, freelance artists, we've got a road ahead of us yeah. right like and and what can we do so that everyone sort of goes okay i understand what we're looking at here is about long-term sustainable robust sector this is not about anyone running a program this is not about anyone producing an event or that's not what this is about this is about big big picture stuff um so you know i also think the magic part of this that's coming in is um bringing in people from outside the creative sector so i often hear oh it's the same usual people at that event right it's artists selling to artists or it's artists supporting artists and i think that's the other magic piece that's going to happen with this and that you've already done with the research is bringing in those business sector people and like people who are not part of the creative sector and doing this work and doing to the going to those events we're bringing in people that aren't you aren't the usual crowd and that's the missing piece i think you know because how do you support an organization if it is just the freelance artists supporting it you know how how do you bring in that revenue and that sustainability if it's the freelance artist supporting the organization that then supports the freelance artists, there's not a big enough pool to support right. everybody. So I think that's the magic part too, is bringing in that outside perspective. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, wh whoever is a part of these next conversations about, okay, what does this, you know, arts council, arts agency, whatever it is, how is it going to look different? We have lots of samples from communities of our size all over the country. And so we know what their budget sizes look like. We know what their staffing looks like. We know, you know, what their granting programs look like. We know what their corporate fund programs look like. But what's really going to be left to our community is to say, but our community is not exactly like those communities. We don't have your standard, you know, well, here's our equity theater here's our professional dance troupe like we got one of all right yeah. we we don't really we have uh some we have a lot of presenters we we have a lot of freelance artists we have um but we so it's it's interesting we have a lot of community arts organizations we have a different makeup than you see in your kind of typical you know um we have a different make up a different constitution of what the creative sector is and yet in terms of numbers um we certainly have opportunity right like our creative vitality index numbers are not what eau claire's are they are not what grand rapids is um, when we look at these comparable communities we have room to grow for sure uh, but absent of what you think of as those kind of standard like every community has fill in the blank 
absent of those, it's amazing that we have as much, especially economic activity, as we do. And what that means is we've got a lot of hustle going on. We've got a lot of entrepreneurs. We've got a lot of, and these are not non-for-profits, right? These are just hanging out shingles. This is Bo Thomas, right? That's why yep. he gets 2,000 views when you interview him. Yes, absolutely. So we're singular in that way. It's going to be interesting. We've always said, you know, working around here for going to date myself now over 11 years in the arts I think that Green Bay is a different animal you know it is it's like you study all the different cities in like Paducah Kentucky you know you look at all of those arts communities and those communities that were revitalized by art and Green Bay is different Green Bay is unique and it's going to be whatever comes of this is going to be unique to Green yeah. Bay yeah and make no mistake, it's not going to be easy either, right? Like, and that's why I feel like, nope, we're not at the top of the mountain. We're just at a different hard part. <laughs> Maybe it's like a mountain range and there's lots of peaks. <laughs> we'll draw this metaphor. Yeah. Okay, so we've got 15 minutes left. I want to make sure anybody who's on the call, if you have questions, please unmute and just jump into the conversation or feel free to drop questions, anything like that in the chat. And then do you have visuals you want to show us? Do you want to talk data? Or do you have oh i do i have one one visual i'm um so in terms of timing so everyone knows the the final report is literally it's going to be back before december 15th that kind of public tour that we were talking about that's january february um so there will be opportunities and um for lack of a better place now you know it's going to go on the uh Baca website, greenbayart.org, um, and people can read the full report there. We're going to try to make some more digestible versions of it so that you don't actually have to read all 81 pages. Um, but when I was talking about that symbiosis, um, I just wanted to share one visual that I think is a really good example of that, and that is um, this particular slide. Um, I don't know how to make the preview go away, but if you look at all these different lines here, measuring, these are essentially people determining what's the priority for how arts and culture should serve our community. So improve quality of life, health, renew neighborhoods, cultural unity, community engagement, educational opportunities, tourism, uh, talent attraction and retention, existing businesses more attractive, grow the social scene. Um, so each one of these is just, a, you know, asking folks like, what do you think is a priority? And I think it's really remarkable if you look at the ebb and the flow of this overall, all of these sectors, and then the community at large, look at how much higher they rank these priorities than even the arts and creative sector. So the community is saying to us like, you guys are really undervaluing how important we think you are in our community. Um, so, but nonetheless, it's higher and yet it still kind of follows a similar um, uh, peak and valley of, uh, of, um, uh, you know what I'm saying, assigning value to different to different priorities. So that's one example. Another thing, and this really, I think, speaks to what we were just saying about why our community makeup is a little bit different. What's also really clear from the creative sector is when they're talking about what they need, no one here is looking for like great big giant donations to be the solution. That is not what anyone uniformly wants. And our consultants really called that out. They were like, that's interesting. You don't always see that. That what they're really looking for is, is part of what the Artisan and Business Center does, right? Like they really want more investment in that building out a sustainable model. They want capacity building dollars. They want, right, they're not just looking for like, just give me the money to run my programs. So all of these things are gonna be really critical to defining like, what's the mission of this leadership organization? What is it, who are they serving? What are they trying to achieve? And again, it's gonna be unique for our community based on all the feedback from, from the data. I was really hoping that was the slide you were going to share because when I think and like talk to people about this, that's the one I keep kind of referencing was like seeing all of those groups of people 
kind of coming together on that line, on that like journey through those different topics. And I think that's so cool, you know, to see even like the political leaders and the business and the creative sector. I think that's incredible. And that yeah. you're right, it's going to be a lot of work. Yes. <laughs> But it's cool. It's cool to like see this laid out and kind of figure out what the next steps are going to be. And my ba background is like arts management too. So, mm -hmm. you know, that looking at the community and kind of stepping out of my like day to day boots on the ground is exciting for me. It's exciting to see this kind of coming together and see how passionate you are and how passionate the other leaders that have been involved in this and everybody coming from their kind of different perspective to come together for this greater, this bigger mission. And I think that's that's another little bit of magic for us, I think. Yeah, a good example like of how this works in like the the again that exponential impact. So you know the the um the chamber conducts these city study trips where they go and look at other communities and look at ways that they've tackled big community challenges, you know, economic development issues. Um, homelessness, you know, big, big challenges. And um, there was some crossover on the last city study trip. And, uh, you know, the team was in Pittsburgh and we're visiting the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust, the Pittsburgh Symphony. And, and it was great to see those folks who had participated on the steering committee, who had watched this data be collected along the way, start to connect the dots. And, and so for someone like me who works in the arts to be able to ask kind of leading questions of cultural workers to say, can you tell us like, what's the breakdown of your budget? How much is contributed? How much is earned? What does your staff look like? It takes on new meeting for folks who are not creatives, right? They don't work in our sector to to have this foundational learning that's happening across the community. And yes, unification of the creatives and, the, and our art sector is the very first and most important thing that needs to happen over the course of the next year. Um, but we can't forget that we've got to bring all of these people with us or else it doesn't matter. So true. You know, I, I just made, I scribbled down a note so I wouldn't forget it. But you were talking about how the organizations and the people weren't asking for like big money to solve all of their problems. And I, I have seen that, you know, I think our community is so used to making their dollars go as far as they can. And that these tiny, like tiny small budget nonprofits we have serving the arts in here, in this area, are so used to making big things happen with very small amounts of money. And they know that big money could make a big difference for them, but that's not, they're not going to ask for it. You know, I, I see these well, organizations where they're like any, you know, like a $10 donation and they can do amazing things with that. And it's like, that's what Green Bay is really good at. Yeah. And I think that is a universal truth about artists and creatives. You know, I, I laugh all the time and I don't hear it as much as I used to. I think at the beginning of my career, you know, 30 years ago, you would encounter more of this attitude about the artist as being sort of frivolous or, um, you know, oh, that dreamy, you know, like feet off floating in the air and, you know, not grounded in reality. And that's just simply not true. I, I think artists more than anyone can take literally your garbage and turn it into, <laughs> right? Um, and and so I find them to be the most resourceful, the most innovative. We are woefully under-resourced and um, it, you know, it's not always, I think, tasteful to people to have to use the vocabulary of other sectors, to have to use the tools of other sectors for advocacy, but in fact, it is effective. And that doesn't mean that I don't have great respect for other approaches to the work I do. This just happens to be an area that I have experience in and I I know is proven it can work. And it makes sense for this area. It makes yeah. sense for the industries in this area. It makes sense for the size of our community. You know, I think that you've taken a really great approach and I'm really excited to see what's next. I think it's going to be uh, an exciting and interesting journey. 
Thanks, Carrie. I really want to thank you for inviting me to have the conversation um, and that the conversation will exist in this format. Um, I think that that's going to be really useful. I appreciate that. Found, yeah, so a little artist journey tidbit. So it started in person before I got here to this role, but then I took over, the world shut down, and we pivoted virtually, and now we're never going back because what I have discovered is that artists don't want me to say, be here at 5.30, cram into a room, listen to this presentation. They want to turn these recordings on when they're painting in the middle of the night, when they're eating dinner, when they're holding their kids, you know, when they're doing other things. And that's been kind of the beauty of this is that, you know, we've got a handful of people here with us live. They can interact if they want to. People have that opportunity. But then the recordings live on our YouTube channel and on our social media, and it reaches so many more people than I could even fit in a room. And I think that's one of the coolest things. So I am so thankful that you joined me today. And thank you for the reschedule with all of this situation I have going on. I appreciate that and your flexibility. And I'm excited for the future. I am really hopeful for Green Bay. I shouldn't say hopeful because it's going to happen. <laughs> I'm really glad you came back from Sturgeon Bay. I mean, I love Sturgeon Bay. I always will. And I love working in the museum up there. But, you know, this is my this is my place. This is where I'm meant to be. So it's good. We're I'm a visual artist. You, oh, thank you. And same to you. You moved up here from far away, right? Not far away. I'm from Chicago. Oh, hey, <laughs> that's a whole nother state. <laughs> it's a three hour drive, as I try to remind my mother on a regular basis. Oh my god. <laughs> three hours is nothing. I drive three hours west to my sisters. So hey. My relationship to distance and time has changed entirely. Like, oh, I don't God. think anything of driving 45 minutes now. Because you can get, like, in 45 minutes, you can go hundreds of miles. It feels Absolutely. And see a whole different landscape, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to those of you who joined us virtually today. I appreciate it. We will get this recording edited and posted to social media probably yet this week. So. Thanks, Carrie. Absolutely. Thanks, Kelly. Bye.